In this series we'll create our own 64-bit operating system from scratch. Initially we'll make an x86 compatible operating system which is multi-boot 2 compliant, but we may expand this to other architectures and bootloaders in the future. This operating system is going to be primarily written in the C programming language but we'll also need some assembly for any of the hardware specific code. I'll be using the Visual Studio Code IDE throughout the series. In this first episode we'll set up our basic tooling and then we'll be able to get a hello world on the screen. To simplify the building process I highly recommend you download and install docker and I will talk more about that later. You're also going to need to install Keymuse so that you can emulate your operating system instead of going through the hassle of installing the OS on your computer or loading it on a USB or anything like that. Finally, we're going to need to install NASM, GRUB and this specific GCC cross compiler. However, I'll be using Docker to simplify this process. So Docker will allow us to create a reproducible build environment so that you'll have the exact same software installed as I do for building our operating system. So what we are going to do is create a Docker image and a Docker image is like a snapshot of a Linux machine with any extra software and files installed onto it. If you haven't used Docker before, I highly recommend you check it out, but you should still be able to follow along fine. So we're just going to create a folder, I'll name it build environment, and in here we're going to create a Docker file. This file will describe all the steps we need to create our build environment image. We'll base our image on this pre-made image which holds all the GCC compilation tools we'll need, so we'll just need these three lines here. And now we'll add in some commands to run within this machine before the final image is produced in order to install a few more packages. So we're going to run the apt-get command to install NASM and NASM will allow us to compile our assembly code. We're also going to need the grub package for building our final ISO file. So we'll need grub pc bin and also grub common. And I also believe we need Zeriso for the grub package to work. We'll also hook up a volume to our development environment so that we have access to all our files and we'll just locate this in the env folder. And then we'll also set this folder as the starting folder. So we can now open up our terminal and build our image, assuming you have docker running. So we can simply run docker build followed by build environment which is the name of this folder here, followed by dash t and then a tag name that we're going to give to our image. So I'm just going to name this myOS build environment. So now I'll just hit enter. And for you this may take 5 minutes, but because I've already built this image before, it finished instantly. So now we can spin up an instance of this image, which is known as a container, using either of the commands here, depending on whether you are on Mac, Linux or Windows. In my case, I am on Windows. And make sure this part is the same as the tag you gave to the image earlier. So now we are inside a virtual Linux machine with access to all the tools we need. Also, if you're having any trouble with an unshared drive, make sure your Docker daemon has access to the drive holding your development environment, and you can change that in settings, and then shared drives. So in my case, I had to tick the C drive. Okay, so now we can start coding our operating system. So we'll create a source folder to hold all our source code. And you can organize this however you want, however I like to create an implementation folder to hold all our implementation files. And we'll start off by creating some x86 assembly code, and this will be the entry point into our operating system. And we'll also have to integrate it with multiboot too. So we'll create a boot folder and we'll start by creating a header.asm file. Inside this assembly file, we are going to be adding in some data which is to be included in the operating system binary. This magic data is necessary so that bootloaders can understand that we have an operating system here that can be run on your computer. So as you may know, the operating system isn't actually the first thing that starts on the computer, but rather the bootloader is. And the core responsibility for a bootloader is to locate an operating system in whatever way appropriate to the specific computer. So whether that be somewhere on your hard drive or on a USB drive or maybe on a CD. And then once the bootloader has found any operating systems, it will be able to start them. 
So we're going to be following the multi-boot 2 specification which most bootloaders support. So we'll create two labels to define the start and the end of our header and anything in between here will be our header data. So initially we're going to need to put in a magic number that multiboot2 will look for and by the way in case you don't know anything after a semicolon is a comment. So we can just use dd to add in the data of this magic number which I'll paste and I'll add in a comment here multiboot2. Next we need to specify some information about the architecture of our operating system and we'll just put in 0 and this means protected mode i386 in case you're wondering. The next piece of data we need is the length of our header and since we have these two labels here we can use them to programmatically uh, calculate the length of the header so we can just do header end minus header start and then finally we need a checksum so we'll need one followed by eight zeros and then minus the sum of all the data we have in our header so we just need to copy and paste that and then we'll add in zero and then we'll add in the header length. Okay and then finally we're going to add in a name for this section and this will allow us to position it correctly later when we are linking our operating system. So I've just decided to name it multiboot header. And actually I almost forgot we also need to add in an end tag just to say that we don't have any more data. So we need two DWs and one DD. Okay, so now we can start on the main.asm file, which will be the entry point into our operating system. So we'll create a start label for our entry point, and we're going to have to make that global so that we can access it when we're linking. We're also going to put this into the text section, which is basically just the code section of our binary. And we'll also need to set the bits to 32. I believe this is because our instructions are still in 32-bit mode at this point and we won't be switching over to 64-bit mode until the next video. And when the operating system runs, we'll print some text onto the screen, and I'm afraid we won't actually be printing Hello World until the next episode, but for this episode, we're just going to print OK. So in order to print some characters onto the screen, we are going to have to write directly to quote-unquote video memory. The CPU will hook the text stored at this memory up to your screen. So we'll use the move instruction to put some data into the address of video memory which begins at 0xb8000 and I will paste the following data which represents OK. In the next episode we will be writing C code to print any text on the screen and we will be looking more closely at how this text is represented. Once we've successfully printed that to the screen we'll use the halt instruction which will instruct the CPU to uh, completely freeze and not run any further instructions. So that is all the assembly code written for this first episode and now we can move on to setting up some linker and grub configurations. So I'm going to create a folder called targets and in here I will create an x8664 folder and in here we'll hold all the files we need specifically for building for x86 and in the future we may expand this to other systems. So we'll start off by creating our linker file which will describe how to link our operating system together. So we must first define what the entry point is into our operating system and if you remember earlier we specified that with the name start. We'll now define all the individual sections of our binary. We'll set the current address equal to one megabyte and this means all our operating system data will start one megabyte in. This is just a conventional place for kernels to be loaded by the bootloader. Our first section will be the boot section and in here we'll include our multi-boot header. And then the next section will be our text section and we'll include our text section. So this means that we'll start one megabyte in, then we'll have our multi-boot header and then we'll have all our CPU instructions. So now we'll move on to creating an ISO folder and this will contain a grub configuration file and then the final produced ISO file. So in here we need to create a boot slash grub folder and in here is where we can place our grub configuration file. So what grub will do is create an ISO file out of our operating system kernel binary and an ISO file is just a very common format for holding your operating system. So if for example you want to put your operating system onto a USB drive then most tools will be looking for an ISO file to do that. 
So in here we have to do a few things. I don't even know what they do. And now we can define a menu entry and presumably here is where we specify uh, the name of our operating system inside the boot menu. So I've just set it to my OS. So our binary is multiboot2 and we're going to locate this at boot slash kernel dot bin. So we'll have a kernel dot bin file inside this boot folder and we'll move on to that later. And then we just need to add in boot. Okay, uh, so if you're using git I recommend you create a git ignore file and add in boot slash kernel dot bin here. So now we can finally move on to writing the commands for building our operating system. And we're going to be including all of this inside a make file. So make is a handy tool for organizing all your build commands and making sure that only files that have been modified get rebuilt so that it's extremely fast. But if you haven't used it before you should still be able to follow along. So we'll create a variable to hold all our x86-64 assembly source files. And we're going to run a shell command. So we'll run the find command to find all files inside source slash implementation slash x86-64. And we'll find all file names ending with .asm. So this variable here will now hold a list of all our assembly source files. Now when we are compiling our code we will be compiling each individual assembly source file to an object file. So I'm also going to create a list of all the object files. So we'll call this asm object files. And we're going to use path substitute. And in here we will pass in our source files. And then what we can do is rename all our assembly input files to our output object files which will be inside the build folder. So now what we can do is define what commands we need to run to build one of our object files from the source files. So we only want to recompile when one of the source files have changed, so we'll just reverse this path substitution. And now we can define the commands we need to build our object files. So first thing we need to do is make sure a directory exists to hold our compiled file. So we'll use the make directory command and we'll get the directory of the file we are compiling. And then we can use and and backslash to run another command. And now we can use nasm to compile our assembly code. So we'll use the f flag to change the format of our object file to elf64. The output will be the name of the object file that we are compiling to. And we'll do another reverse path substitution to go from our object file back to our assembly file. So that will then be the input of the nasm command. So that should be all for compiling our assembly files. So now we'll create a custom phony command called build x86-64. And this should only run if any of the object files have changed, which in turn only run if any of the source files have changed. So our final ISO file is going to be in dist slash x86-64. We'll then use the linker command to link our object files, but specifically we'll want the x86-64 elf variant. So we'll set our output to be kernel.bin. We're going to use our linker script in targets x86-64 linker.ld. And then we can pass in our object files as input. So as we defined in our grub config file, in order to generate the final ISO file, we are looking for the kernel.bin file in this boot folder here. So what we'll have to do is copy the kernel.bin file from the dist folder into this boot folder. And then finally we can generate our ISO file using grub. So we'll use the grub make rescue command. We seem to need to pass in this architecture directory for the command to successfully build the ISO file. And we'll put our output in the x86 dist folder in kernel.iso. And then we need to specify this ISO folder here, which holds our grub configuration. So that's in targets x86-64 ISO. And now we should be finally able to build our operating system kernel. So we'll come back into our terminal inside our Docker container. So all we have to do is run make followed by build x86-64. And as you can see, a kernel ISO file has been generated inside the dist folder. And now we can exit out of our Docker container.
And now if you have Kemu installed, you should be able to emulate the operating system. So we'll run the Kemu system x86-64 CD-ROM, and then the path to the ISO file. And as you can see, our operating system is running, and the text OK has appeared on the screen. So that is going to mark the end of this first episode. In the next episode, we will be switching to 64-bit mode. We will be linking with C code, and we will be writing a print function that can print any string onto the screen. Special thanks to my top Patreon supporters, Helsfar, Hesevik, Lizette, and Cass. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and consider becoming a Patreon supporter. If you have any problems or questions, please leave a comment below. Thank you for watching and I will see you again in the next episode.